Book burning has now come to America. It is book burning in a new form. I would call it stealth book burning, but in some ways it's even more insidious than the public ritual of book burning. Now, book burning is symbolized in a very gruesome way by the infamous uh, Nazi book burning. Uh, this was in uh, May of 1933. It was organized by Joseph Goebbels. It occurred actually on several um, campuses around uh, Germany. And we recreated the scene in my movie, uh, Death of a Nation. Here's a short clip of it. Um, listen. The Nazi concept was called Gleichschaltung, which means bringing all the cultural institutions in line with Nazi ideology. This was the significance of the Heil Hitler salute and the draping of swastika flags off balconies. These things signaled humble conformity, the Nazi doctrine. So as you can see from the clip, the book burning is part of a, a larger thing. First of all, the book burnings occurred in 34 different towns uh, in Germany. It wasn't a single uh, place. And after the book burning, a lot of these uh, Nazi youth um, would go to publishers, they would go to warehouses, they would uh, call for books to be removed, banned, libraries. And the idea here was to, quote, clean up Germany to remove the um, contamination of dangerous books. And what were these danger dangerous books? Well, very often they were books by other German writers. Heinrich Hein, Bertolt Brecht, people like this were targeted uh, for their books to be uh, eradicated and, and literally set to, the, set to the flames. Now, this has become a, uh, a symbol of intolerance, of Nazi hatred. Uh, and I think in America, the left, although they've done uh, some book burnings, there was a book burning of uh, some Bibles that occurred uh, in the aftermath of the um, uh, Black Lives Matter protests. But by and large, the book burning is a stealth book burning. Uh, it's the book burning of Amazon, for example, not featuring books to sell, publishers withdrawing books from publication, professors. Uh, not assigning books in class, removing them from circulation, making them difficult to obtain. Uh, people um, being suppressed on social media for their ideas. And then in some ways, uh, self-censorship. Uh, I notice this because this even happens. We have this discussion, Debbie and I do, typically when we're thinking about the podcast. She'll say, well, you know, if you talk about this, you run the risk of being kicked off YouTube. You know, if you do this, uh, Facebook could demonetize you or ban you or flag you. And it is amazing that, you know, we're talking here not about uh, me reciting epithets or denouncing some ethnic group, none of that. We're talking about legitimate debates in the mainstream of American politics having to do with the most current issues of the day. Uh, my friend, uh, Debbie's friend, uh, Joe Paggs, um, a radio host, uh, was uh, thrown off uh, Twitter. Um, and uh, was thrown off Twitter for what? For a hashtag, hydroxychloroquine works. Can you imagine? Um, and now, of course, there are multiple studies showing that hydroxychloroquine does help. But at the time, this was taboo. This was, quote, misinformation. Think of who makes these decisions. Who decides what's misinformation? Um, I know with, with other, this podcast is uh, sponsored by Salem, and I've got these co-hosts at Salem, um, people like um, Eric Metaxas, Sebastian Gorka, and, and Pags, uh, of course, is not on Salem, but he's also in the radio world. And all these guys have been dinged for this and zinged for that. Um, and here is... Um, uh, Abigail Schreier. Abigail Schreier is a uh, writer who has written a book about um, the trans phenomenon. Now, interestingly, she's not against trans adults, but she noticed something very strange, which is that there is a huge increase or an almost preposterous increase in young people, young children, uh, particularly teenage girls identifying as trans. In... Um, um, in Great Britain, for example, the number of teenage girls identifying as trans is up 4,400%. And so naturally, this is kind of a remarkable phenomenon. If being trans is something that has always been around, uh, why the surge now? What's going on? And basically, Abigail Schreier finds out that what's going on is that there is this kind of 
cultural pressure going on. And there is a kind of abdication by the medical community. You got these young girls who are lonely, they're confused. Uh, and so when they go to seek help, uh, they say, well, you know, I'm, I wonder, uh, I'm wondering about my sexuality. I sometimes wonder if I'm too much like a boy. Right away, uh, the medical professionals go, oh, we've got to affirm you in your new identity. We've got to start giving you testosterone shots. And so you've got this abuse of medical practice. In any event, whatever you think of all this, this is a book discussing all of this and discussing it in an intelligent way. And so what happens? Target and Amazon just pulled the book. You can't buy it there. And not only that, but the ACLU, an organization established to defend civil liberties, sides with the book burners. Uh, one of the ACLU lawyers, unbelievably, is quoted as saying that this book, this is a book that he, this is a hill, suppressing this book, he says, I'm going to quote him, stopping this book is a hill that he's willing to die on, die on. This is, by the way, a trans uh, ACLU type. Um, all kinds of people write Abigail Shry and say, your book is really good, but we can't say that publicly. So these are medical professionals. These are people in the media. And Abigail Schreier rightly says that what you have here is an atmosphere of fear. Uh, and people are reluctant to come to your defense. Um, the, um, there was a, um, a demonstration in Canada. This was a, um, the LBGTQ group, which basically said that they are going to dissociate themselves from a library, a public library. Um, because uh, this book was uh, damaging to trans people. To even discuss this topic in this way is damaging. Uh, and so the um, Halifax Pride, this is the annual LGBTQ festival, uh, said we're going to cut ties with this library system. So the library tried to negotiate with them. This is basically how libraries get into the book burning business. And said, listen, well, why don't we, why don't we direct everyone who asks for this book to a list of, quote, trans-affirming resources? But these guys were like, no, that's not going to do it. We're not, we're not satisfied. We want this book out. And so in a, in a library of 1.2 million volumes, this book and one other book were targeted. They just could not be even included. And interestingly, the and we're now talking about Canada, the Nova Scotia Library Association, the Canadian Library Association, dead silent. You would think that they would step in for free speech. But no, ironically, this great, important value of free speech developed in Western civilization that's been a great engine of open inquiry. Open inquiry, not just in the public square for politics, but a great engine of open inquiry for scholarly investigation, for advancement in the sciences, uh, for advancements in the law, because, of course, the legal system depends on discovery, depends upon a kind of open-mindedness but it's being shut down all over the place. And this is the new form uh, of, of book burning. Essentially, the fear that people suffer, well, partly it's the fear that you'll be thrown off social media, partly it's the fear you'll lose your job, but it's also, Abigail Schreier says, it's the fear of ostracism. Ostracism is a very powerful force in society. It's the fear that you'll be, quote, excommunicated from society. You'll be treated as a pariah. And going back to the ancient Greeks, the ancient Greeks actually had this sort of policy of ostracizing people, which is banishing them from society. And some people thought it was so awful that they would, they would prefer death to ostracism because being cut off from a community, uh, you know, Aristotle says that man is a social animal. To be cut off from the society that is yours and that you value is in a sense to face a certain kind of social death or a social extinction. Um, the Nazis understood book burning and they had this public liturgy of book burning. Uh, in America, book burning takes a different form. Uh, a, a quieter form. Don't burn the book. You don't have to burn the book. The book isn't even available for sale. No one's going to see it anyway. This may not be called book burning, but it's book burning all the same.